I want to thank, I, Kelly's not here this morning, but uh, she's traveling, but Kelly and Kenny, the, the, the team that put that VBS together, uh, kind of, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, that they got the uh, idea to do it, and they did put it together, so Kenny and Kelly, thank you, and then all the helpers were so good, all the adults, and uh, we had some younger kids helping, and Nancy and her kitchen crew as always, you, we eat like kings during this week. It's unbelievable. It is really unbelievable. So the whole thing was a spiritual feast, a fellowship feast, a food feast. It was just great. So uh, I hope we'll always be able to do that by God's grace, just a spiritual blessing. All right. Uh, don't want to forget this. Uh, Victor and Anita, I knew I was forgetting something. I got a book for you guys, Miracles in Unexpected Places. It's a great family worship book to do. So at some point uh, before we leave, I don't want that to be lost upon us. All right, please turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and while you're headed there, let me say, as Anita said, parenting is hard. Parenting is hard. For example, what do you do when your kids are so smart they can argue circles around you? Like the one child who came home and said, guess what, Dad? I got a hundred today in school. Well, that's great, son. What in? He says, well, I got a 60 in spelling and a 40 in reading. <laughs> How can you argue with that? I mean, he did get a hundred. And he's obviously great at math, so, you know, something's good is going on there. And kids are way more bold than they used to be. I never would have told my dad things like, you know, for $50, I'll be good all weekend. <laughs> I, you, know, you know what my dad would have said? He would have said, 50 bucks, that's ridiculous. When I was your age, I was good for nothing. <laughs> now you know where I got it. Since I'll be gone the Sabbath closest to Father's Day, I thought we'd tip our hat to men today. Last month, all the women received a bag overflowing with goodies. Did you see that swag bag? It was unbelievable what was in there. Unbelievable. Goodies for Mother's Day. So men, guess what they gave us? A free lunch at Potluck. <laughs> men? That's just much too generous, ladies, much too generous. But uh, that was great. All right. You know, a stereotypical man brims over with brute strength and self-sufficiency. Men are typically pictured as warrior, hunter, pioneer, adventurer, builder of marvels. But in the best stories, in the best ones, it's the legendary sacrifices they make in order to achieve those that greatness so the great news for men today is that it's not just history or hollywood where men of sacrifice are apt to be found because the fact is the characteristic that ties healthy families together above all others this is number one above all others is the presence of sacrificially loving men in the home Sacrificially loving men, uh, unbelievable influence. And that's why this morning's message is entitled, The Sacrifices of a Father's Love. Well, I want us to first look at the concept of sacrifice itself as we turn to Romans 5, beginning with verse 6. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his love, his great love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to ask you an honest question. Just be honest. How many of us could willingly sacrifice ourselves for everyone who hated us, or for that matter, never heard of us, or for that matter, 
couldn't care less that we existed. How many of us would willingly give our lives for those particular people? Any takers? I don't see anyone, you know, knocking the, the door down to get on that train. Well, uh, the truth is we're more likely to get even with our enemies or to turn bitter or ignore them. But Jesus is amazing because he took on all the bad things he didn't deserve so he could give us all the good things he deserved. That's just incredible sacrifice uh, that he did. But what I want to bring out today on Father's Day is that Jesus wasn't alone in that sacrificial gift, was he? He wasn't alone. There's a reason that out of the almost 25,000 words Jesus spoke in the Bible, one out of every 140 of them referred to the Father. You know, you think it's all about me, me, you know, and this is my mission. No, he's always referring to the Father. His central message and purpose was to restore us to a saving relationship with who? Our daddy in heaven. Robert uh, uh, Gennetti earlier this week, Junior, was just, just waxing eloquent about that at, at VBS one evening about how beautiful it is that the Jews for, you know, the two plus thousand years of ex existence, God was... El Shaddai and the Almighty and all powerful and all of this, but Jesus comes and he says, well, don't forget, he's also daddy. He's also dad, and that was shocking, that he's daddy, he's father and he's, and he's dad. But let, let's go on with this. Jesus didn't come to earth because God was so angry with us that Jesus' sacrifice had to stop the Father's anger. Instead, we have texts like we read in this is love, not that we love God first, but what? God first loved us. And that's why the Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The Bible does not say that the world was reconciling itself to God. No, it was nothing the world could offer. And God said, no, I'm starting this. I'm going to be the one that does it. You know, the enemy has passed around so many distorted, warped pictures of God. But Jesus said, the truth is, the Father himself loves you. He loves you. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So we serve a totally self-sacrificing God instead of a self-serving God. Satan says God is selfish, self-serving. He robs us from the greatest pleasure and joys in life. But the truth is that Satan is a liar and God is a being of totally self-sacrificing love. So this brings us to the first way dads can sacrificially reflect our heavenly father. Just as the father puts the needs of a sinful world above his own in the gift of his son, so we as dads can cheerfully put the needs of our wives and children before our own. I want to, I want to share a principle with you that uh, how many of you, a couple weeks ago, I asked you if you knew a language. How many of you know that language good enough to be an interpreter? Anyone good enough to know another language be interpreter? A couple of you can, right? That would be great. Well, guess what? In the language and culture of heaven, mom and dad are the most influential interpreters of who God is and what he should mean to them. You and I as parents interpret God to our kids. That's where they learn the language of heaven and what his culture, what his nature, everything about him is like. So here's the point. When dads give their hearts to their kids, the kids are much more likely to give their hearts to their heavenly father. Is that true? Much more likely. 
One of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books tells of an 11-year-old girl who asked her daddy one day, what are you going to get me a few years from now when I turn 15? on my 15th birthday. And her dad said, look, I, I have no idea. That's still a long way off. Well, at the age of 14, she fainted and was rushed to the hospital. The doctor came out and told her dad that she had a bad heart and probably wasn't going to make it. She would most likely die. When she was lying in the hospital bed, she said, Daddy, have they told you that I'm going to die? Tell me, what did they say? The father replied, no, you're going to live. But how can you be sure, Daddy? He said, I just know. Well, a short time later, she turned 15. And after she was recovering at home, she found a letter on her bed which read, my dearest daughter, if you are reading this, it means that everything went well just as I told you it would. A few years ago, you asked what I was going to give you for your 15th birthday. I didn't know then, but now we both know it was my heart. It was my heart. You know, most of us will never be put in such a dramatic position as that. But there's a very doable way that we can, our kids can know that they have our hearts. And this is best illustrated by elephants. How many of you enjoy elephants? If, uh, well, I used to collect them. And we had a fun uh, a prank that uh, we would pull among church members in Michigan. We would steal each other's elephants. They said it was a thing. So we did it. But uh, I love elephants. But uh, here's a great illustration of this. Um, there were some trumpety elephants, teenage elephants, in an African game park who were actually uh, gone nuts doing some pretty unelephanty things, if that's possible. They had been agitating the rhinos unduly. They had been threatening the tourists in the game park, something they normally didn't do. Park officials finally figured out what was happening. As newborns, these elephants had been taken away from a game reserve that was being threatened by poachers. So they brought them to a new park that was supposed to be a pachyderm's paradise, except for one problem. Their fathers had not been taken with them. So these young elephants had no fatherly model of how a good elephant should behave. Good elephants don't stop on tourists, I guess. Well, this takes us to, I'm sorry, this brings us to the second way we can reflect our Heavenly Father's sacrificial love, and this is serious, we as dads can model what it means, what it looks like to be in love with Jesus. Now, I realize that's different from home to home and personality to personality. Some tend toward this portrayal and some tend toward that portrayal. I get that, that's all good. But whatever is authentic for you, whatever is authentic for you, your kids need to see you model that you are in love with Jesus. Our kids need to see that we love to pray to the Father, that we love to depend on Him, that we love to express our gratitude to Him. It's not just mom, it's the Father. They should be leading out in that. So for dads to reflect the model of our Heavenly Father, our, our families also need to see dads uh, model what it looks like to apologize when we're wrong, to forgive when we've been hurt, to be a peacemaker and a healer instead of an at source of agitation and pain. But there's a third way. And by the way, I, I, I want to I wanna maybe linger on that one more moment. You know, all of us fall. All of us have bad moments where um, we're impatient, we're grumpy, uh, we're just simple, and we just don't say nice things. All of us. 
but you, you don't want to make that a trend. And first of all, what you want to do so that the kids see, well, is God a God of love? Is God a nice God? Is God someone I'd want to be with? If we send the message to our kids that God is harsh, that God is impatient, that God has no time to listen and be compassionate to what you're going through, though I may not understand, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen. I'm going to try to, uh, try to enter into that the best that I can. When kids think, well, you just don't have a heart for what I'm going through, then, then that rubs off, that affects. Remember, we're the most influential interpreters of heaven to our kids. So they've got to see that God's heart loves them. God's heart for them is compassionate. God's heart for them is long-suffering. God's heart for them isn't always agitated and angry and they can never measure up and they never do right. Yeah, we have to confront things. Yes, there are boundaries. Yes, there are consequences, of course. But they've got to see that we are tender-hearted above everything else. There's a third way we can reflect the Father's sacrificial love and that's by giving our time. I love this. A group of uh, school kids were asked the definition of a father. Why did God make fathers? What's their purpose? And the number one answer they gave is, a dad is for spending time with. Isn't that beautiful? A dad is for spending time with. That's great news because it means they're not only looking for toys, <laughs> they're not looking for some incredible talent, they just want our time. Listen to this, one study, psychologists attached microphones to the shirts of kids to record parental interaction. And the average amount of daily time each dad spent with his kids was 37 seconds. 37 seconds. I remember having one substantive conversation with my dad during my whole growing up years, and it lasted less than one minute. It was one minute. But uh, he was effective, he was efficient. All right. A father came home from work late, again tired and irritated. He found his young son waiting at the door. The child looked up and said, Daddy, how much money do you make an hour? Well, the dad said, uh, he got angry. He said, that's none of your business. Why do you want to know? Well, I just want to know. Please tell me, how much do you make? Well, wanted to get this over and relax. He said, 20, 20 an hour. Well, the little boy sighed and said, well, daddy, may I please borrow $10? <laughs> dad, the father flew off the handle saying, you only wanted to know so you could ask uh, for some more money to buy some lame toy? Uh, go to your room, I don't have time for this. Oh, wow, well, the boy was so sad, but after a while, the man calmed down and uh, started to think that maybe he was a bit hard on his child, so he went up to his room, and he said, look, it's been a long day, and I took it out on you. Here's the 10 bucks you asked for. The little boy began to beam. Oh, thank you, Daddy. Then reaching under his pillow, he pulled out a wad of crumpled up bills. And seeing the boy already had some money, the dad started to get angry again. And he, he said, uh, as the son uh, began to slowly count his money, he said, why do you want more money if you already have some? The father demanded. Well, I didn't have enough, but now I do. So, Daddy, I'd like to buy an hour of your time. Folks, I hope our kids never have to say that to us. But if you don't get anything else from today's short message, the next point really sums up all we're really trying to say. We can know the depths of someone's love for us by what it costs them to love. Just think about that. We can know the depths someone loves us by what it costs them to love. And dads, kids see the cost of our love for them as we put our family's needs above our own. They see what it costs us as we give them our hearts as well as our time. They see what it costs us as we model to be in love with Jesus. They see what it costs us as we back that up by becoming peacemakers and healers in the home. I'd like to wind down now 
with two short stories. First one is there was a Navy fighter pilot in World War II named Butch O'Hare. During one mission in the South Pacific, he looked at his fuel gauge and realized he had, uh, someone had forgotten to top off his fuel tank, and now he wouldn't have enough to complete his mission and return back to his ship. His flight leader told him, ordered him back to the carrier. So reluctantly, he turned back, but then he saw a squadron of Japanese Zeros heading toward the American fleet. Since the American fighters were all on a mission, they were defenseless. So he was determined to somehow divert them away from the American ships. So laying aside all thoughts of personal safety, he dove right into the formation of those Japanese planes. He weaved in and out until he broke up their formation and his ammunition was spent. But even then, he continued the assault. It was unbelievable. He dove at the zeros, trying to at least clip off a wing or a tail uh, in hopes of damaging their planes. Finally, the exasperated Japanese squadron turned and uh, sped away. Deeply relieved, O'Hare limped back his tattered fighter to the carrier. But here it is. Later on, the film from the camera mounted on the plane showed the extent of Butch's heroism in protecting the fleet. He became a highly decorated uh, war hero, and perhaps you have even heard of the huge airport in Chicago that's named in tribute to his sacrificial courage. Now, one more last story. Some years earlier than our first story, there was a man in Chicago named Easy Eddie. At that time, Al Capone virtually owned the city, but he wasn't famous for anything heroic. He was notorious uh, for everything from bootlegging booze, prostitution rings, as well as murder. Easy Eddie was Capone's lawyer, and his legal maneuverings were so good that he always kept Big Al out of jail. To show his appreciation, Capone gave Easy Eddie all the material wealth and uh, high living that anyone could ever desire. So because of that, Easy Eddie overlooked all the atrocities and crimes that Al Capone was committing. Eddie's one soft spot was a son whom he dearly loved. He made sure his son had the best of everything from clothing to education to travel. No price uh, was too much. And despite his involvement with organized crime, Eddie tried to teach his son to rise above his own sordid life. He wanted him to be better than he was, yet there were two things he couldn't pass on to his son, a good name and a good example. He said, easy as he said, I wanted to change that. I want to do something different. So one day, Easy Eddie reached a difficult decision. He said, I want to rectify all the wrongs that I've been committing. So he went to the authorities and he did the unthinkable. What happens when you snitch on the mob? He told everything to the authorities about Al Capone and they had been trying to get him for years. He would try to clean up his tarnished name and offer his son some semblance of integrity. To do that, he had to testify against the mob, knowing the cost and risk he was making for his son. Because more than anything, he wanted to be an example so he could leave a good name for his child. So he testified, and within the year, Easy Eddie's life was snuffed out in a hail of gunfire. But he at last had given the greatest gift he could offer at the greatest price he could pay. And perhaps by now, you've come to realize the connection between the stories, for Butch O'Hare was Easy Eddie's son beautiful story. 
Today we've seen that we can know the depths of someone's love for us by the cost of their love. So the question becomes, are there any dads here who want to reflect our Heavenly Father's sacrificial love in the way you love your family? By giving them your heart and time and compassion, by modeling how to be in love with Jesus, and by becoming the peacemakers and healers of the home. Our last appeal comes from a short video I'd like to share with you. Um, we're going to turn down the lights. It's actually a Met Life ad uh, from China or Hong Kong, some Asian country, and yet it, it makes a powerful appeal to us. Let's watch it together. Daddy is the sweetest daddy in the world. <laughs> daddy is the most handsome. The smartest. The most clever. The kindest. My Superman. Daddy wants me to do well at school. Daddy is just great, but he lies. He lies about having a job. He lies about having money. He lies that he is not tired. He lies that he is not hungry. He lies that we have everything. He lies about his happiness. He lies because of me. Isn't that beautiful? Is a child's life worth every sacrifice? I hope every man here could say yes, it is. Let's pray. Loving Father, you know that sometimes we're a motley crew, 
Sometimes we are heroic. We're a mixture, uh, Father, but we want to do what's right. And we want to make the kind of sacrifices we've talked about today that enable our children to get the best picture of God they possibly can despite the times that we fall short. But our heart's intention, our heart's intention is to say what's right about our Heavenly Father. Our heart's intention is to give them the best possible picture that God is not someone to be afraid of, but someone to be a friend of. Let them know by our heart that God is the greatest being you could ever desire in your life. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.